patterns and anti-patterns. First, <clears throat> what are design patterns? This is the most, I think, the most famous book about redesign patterns, uh, which is um, written, I don't know how many years ago, many, uh, by these uh, four people, and that's why the book is called, who knows what's the name of this book, very famous, it's called the book Gang of Four, G-O-F, G, large G, then O small, then F big, it's very, very, very uh, famous <laughs> reference, so you can meet this uh, G-O-F patterns um, everywhere, so if you go for the interview, um, then most probably they're going to ask you, what G-O-F design patterns do you know? So you have to read this book. I highly recommend you do that. The book says that, uh, what's the, what is design patterns? You can read this quote. Basically, the idea is that design pattern is something that experienced programmers, they know how to do, and they do it again because they've done it already, already once. For example, you know, very simple example, you know how to sort an array of numbers because you learned, I don't know, bubble sort or some, I don't know, some other sort. So you know how to do it. You've done it already. And when you meet this problem again, you're not going to invent it from scratch. You're not going to open the book again, read the book, understand that. You just know you remember that. So you take this as a copy, this method from somewhere, and re-implement it. Basically, you copy and paste it sometimes. This is design pattern. But design pattern is not about copy-paste. It's not about taking the copy of code and placing it here. It's more about applying the knowledge. So you remember that it was a good idea to, while sorting, to use, I don't know, uh, integer numbers instead of long integer because this and that. I'm, I'm improvising. And th because of that, you do it again. So you basically bring your knowledge to the project and do the same or very similar in, this, in, this, uh, in the new project, which is a very good idea in general. However, some people believe it's a bad idea. We met this guy on the previous lecture. Uh, he said in his um, very uh, famous uh, blog post, Revenge of the Nerds, at the end of the post he says uh, that any regularity in the code is a sign that I'm using the abstraction that aren't powerful enough. And he's right. So he's saying that if, you, if you've done sorting, for example, in one way here, and then you do another project, and you do sorting the same way here, then why didn't you implement a library for sorting? Why didn't you make a class which would sort? Why didn't you make a module which will sort? Why do you need to reapply the same here? Why applying it there didn't trigger you, didn't provoke, didn't motivate you to create this abstraction and put it somewhere as a library, as a framework, as a concept, whatever? So why you keep moving, keep bringing the same ideas from project to project? Why you keep doing the same stuff over and over again? So when you start a project, think about this. When you start a new project, you should not say, oh, I know how to do this. Okay, I'll copy these files. I place the files over there. I copy this, this, this. I put the, all the information there. I combine it. I know because I've done it before. So I take maybe some examples from there. I put everything there. Boom, the product works. If you need time to assemble all that, if you need time to re-implement, to apply your knowledge again, and they're producing something which is very similar to what you've done before, then you're doing it wrong. Then you are not really, like this guy said, experienced engineer. You're just a coder, probably. You're just a somebody who is, you know, for a payroll, making the implementations which already are well known, which already are clear enough, but you're not really making the proper abstraction. Every time you see that there is a place for you to re-implement your knowledge, that's an opportunity to make a library, an opportunity to make a framework, an opportunity to make something new which, will, which can be reused, not copied. So there are two opinions about design patterns, the good and the bad. I'm leaning towards the second opinion by Paul Graham. I think that he's right, that uh, design patterns is... Um, uh, not really a bright idea in general, even though it helps young programmers to understand what experienced programmers already learned. That's for sure. So when you open this book, uh, this uh, design patterns, this Gang of Four book, or many other books, there are many books about design patterns, you will learn a lot. I suggest you read it. I suggest you read many books about design patterns, uh, find many websites about design patterns, they exist, and you will become definitely more knowledgeable as a programmer. But keep in mind, design patterns 
are good for junior programmers, but are bad for experienced ones. So these guys are wrong about experience. Good pro young programmers, yes, we learn a lot. I, when I was uh, much younger, I was reading these books about design patterns, all of them, most, many of them. I have maybe five of them, these books on design patterns. So I, 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 I learned how people do it. I said, okay, yeah, I know this. This is new something to me. This is what I also do. It's a really good source of knowledge. But then don't copy this many, many times. One, two, three times, that's enough. And then make abstraction. Uh, Okay, so now let's talk about something more specific. First, we're gonna consider some patterns. I'm not gonna show you all patterns. There are t tons of them. I'll show you just a few. Then we're gonna talk about some anti-patterns. So people not only have design patterns, they also have anti-patterns. Anti-pattern is something that you shouldn't do. For example, we discussed null pointers. So null pointer and null references are design pattern. So anybody, or for example, I'm telling you that this is for me is an anti-pattern. So don't use static methods. Don't use null pointers. And you say, okay, we learned from you. We're not going to use it. So this is the anti-pattern. For example, singleton. We're going to discuss it today. Singleton. Who knows about singleton? Some people know. So singleton is a design pattern, which you can read about in the book about design pattern. But I'm thinking that the singleton, not only me, Google it. But I think that singleton is an anti-pattern. So you don't do it. You don't use singletons because it's wrong. But, but the book will say it's a design pattern. But I'm saying it's, a, it's an anti-pattern. So there are patterns and anti-patterns. We're going to discuss some of them. Then we're going to talk about, in my opinion, anti-object-oriented patterns, which we touched a little bit before. But now I'll show you something even more like larger comparing to just static methods or um, this um, null, null, ref, null references. Uh, finally, I'll show you something about refactoring. Who knows what is refactoring? Can you explain what it is? It's when you are not introducing new features, but you improve maintainability and like, the beauty of your code. Right, exactly. So a refactoring is when you don't introduce any new functionality. You don't change the functionality. You don't... You don't change the semantic of the code. So for example, the code was sorting, sorting the array of numbers, so it still keeps sorting, but the algorithm of sorting is different. Now it's not the bubble sort anymore, it's the binary sort. This is refactoring. You, impl you, you change the functionality without changing the, you, sorry, you don't change the functionality, but you change something in the code which makes the code, for example, faster or more maintainable or cleaner or more testable and so on and so forth. And then we go to books, venues, and call to action. So let's start with some patterns. Uh, I actually wrote a blog post five years ago, which is called Design Patterns and Anti-Patterns Love and Hate. Uh, I expressed there, I mentioned there are 36 design patterns, 36. So there are many of them. And uh, I said that 22 of them, I believe, are anti-patterns. It's my subjective opinion. Of course, you can think differently. For example, there I said that singleton is, a design, is an anti-pattern, while decorator or adapter are really good pattern. So there are many of them. You, you can read the post. You can uh, maybe learn something from there. Let's start with this one. Um, don't, actually, uh, don't expect me to give you the proper and right explanation of each design pattern we're going to talk about, because I... Sometimes I make mistakes, sometimes I don't understand these design patterns. It's all, it's all pretty subjective, to my opinion. So I grouped together five different design patterns. Adapter, facade, proxy, decorator, bridge. I think they're all about the same, if you ask me. Many people will complain about that, me saying this, but I believe they're all about the same. So take a look at the code. Let's say we have on top, we have the class database. The class database implements only one method. Method is called SQL. SQL, you give the query with the Q parameter, and it returns you something which is coming from the database. Who knows what is SQL? Everybody. That's the language how you talk to relational databases. So, for example, I send there, select something from some table, and the result comes back. Very simple, the first class. The second class is not the second class, the second method, function, whatever, procedure, called echo. The echo expects the parameter book. The book should come in. What it does, it prints the book title and then the book author. So how do we combine these two classes? The first one is the database, the second one, two, two, two pieces of code. The first one is the database, which only understands SQL requests. The second one is the, uh, is the, um, uh, the echo, which expects the book. So we make 
a book, which is called a new class, book in database, which implements the book, which in encapsulates the database, encapsulates the ID, and when the method title is called, it goes to the database, selects the title, and returns it. So now we can give this book in the database to the echo method. So that's probably adapter, or maybe decorator, or maybe proxy, or maybe it's a bridge, or maybe it's a facade, I don't know. They're all similar, but I would call this decorator. So we, use, we have one object which is not good enough for another object. So we have database, but this one is expecting the book. So we build something around this thing and give it together. So we decorate an object. We build a facade here. So you talk not to the database anymore. You talk to me like I'm the book. So it's a facade or it's a proxy. We make a proxy or maybe it's an adapter. So you talk to the adapter and the adapter talks to the real database. That's the idea, that's the design, design pattern. So every time you just understand the concept. So if somebody is expecting an object which you don't have, you can make an object which will look like what they expect, and inside this, that thing, you will do what you need to do. So you decorate your stuff, you, you make an adapter. I think it's pretty obvious. They call it a, a static design pattern, I believe. So there are, be, there are dynamic or behavioral design patterns, and there are structure or static design patterns. So this one is about static. So it's not about action, I believe. It's more about how you build an object and then the object becomes suitable for uh, new scenarios. Good? Clear? I think it is. You don't need to read like, I don't know, 200 pages about this. But in these books, you will read about, about 100 pages about this stuff because they will tell you about the adapter separately, facade separately. There is some difference, of course. The facade is more different than adapter. Sometimes they may say, you know what, the decorator is this one, but adapter is something which, uh, for example, they expect the book, and um, we give them the adapter, and the adapter connects to the database, so not encapsulates the database, but connects to the database. I don't know, but in, re in, in, in the bottom line is that we just give them what they want, and then, uh, and then implement inside what we want. The second, and, and then there is, a, um, there is a blog post about this, uh, about the decorator. So decorator is my favorite design pattern. I believe the decorator is the design pattern for all the time. So if you use it more and more, your code will be better and better. Uh, why would it be better and better? Why it will be better and better? Because the decorator will help you to always do the design like we discussed before. Object into object into object into object. So decorator, when you have something which, uh, which you have the one object, then you need another object to there, so you decorate it, you decorate it, so you always keep your object inside other objects. So you don't let the object stay separately. You, we always want objects to be inside other objects. We don't want objects to be independent. We want objects to be kids of other objects. And decorator is actually pre, uh, pro, uh, encouraging you to do exactly that. So that's, that's why decorator. But read the blog post. I think it explains it. Second one, uh, interesting design pattern, which is probably not going to be used by you very often, but it's interesting to tell about this, just to give you an, like, to give you a, an impression of what is design, what are design patterns. This one is called resource acquisition is initialization. Probably nobody knows about this, I believe. It's, 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 oh, you know about this. Okay, cool. That's, that's great. Um, so it's, it's really basic mechanic in C++, indeed. Um, do you understand the code here? Uh, it's a very simple class called file. Uh, the class encapsulates, first there is a, the second line is the attribute, attribute H. It's just a basically a, a, no, attribute. And then the public, the public is the public sector of the class. The first is the constructor file, which takes the name as the name of the file. And then inside the constructor, we open the file for writing. We open the file and save this number, which is returned by the method open. It's a number, just integer. And we save it into h. h is the attribute. Yes, everything is good. And then the next part is the destructor. Destructor is something that is called when the object loses the scope of visibility. When the scope of visibility loses the object. What happens? Let's discuss, let's discuss in the next tool, in the next four lines. So imagine this is the function void foo. 
this foo on the first line of the void foo, we make a new instance of the class file and call it f. So f is the new instance of the class file. When we make it, we immediately open the file in the constructor, right? Because we call file, the file foo.txt gets opened for writing, and we store this h into the, into the attribute of the class, of the object. Then we write something to the f. I don't know how we do it, so we write it. And then the function ends, the foo. The function is over. The destructor is called. This is how C++ works. In C++, there is no garbage collection like in Java. You know, garbage collection is the, you know, there are two basically approaches, two main approaches to, to mem basically three, I think. Again, I'm not an expert, but I believe there are three approaches to memory management. The first approach is this one. So when the, the scope of visibility starts, like a method, it's called scope of visibility, then you start allocating memory by making objects. You make an, one object, another object, another object, so you basically make those objects. The moment you finish the scope of visibility, all objects are dying, immediately thrown away from memory. So they're dead, 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 dead. C++ destroys them immediately. Calling destructors. On each object, the destructor is called. Destructor, 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 and then the function foo is finished. That's how C++ works. That's first approach to memory management. The second one is more explicit from C language. From C, you, I think in C we have the same, also the, the, this, this approach. But also it's possible to do explicit memory allocation using the give me the memory and I don't need this memory. So in C there are functions, functions like malloc, memory allocation, and m free, like free the memory. So give me one megabyte of memory. The operating system will give you, here it is, one megabyte of memory. And then you say, I don't need this one megabyte of memory. Take it back. And the operating system says, OK, I'll take it back. That's like explicit memory management, which is very, well, very often used in C language. And there is Java approach. Well, other languages also have this garbage collection. Garbage collection is like you open the scope of visibility, you make the object, you close the scope of visibility, the end of the function, but the object stays alive. It's not dead. It stays in the memory. No destructor is called. It's in the memory. It stays alive, and, and the program goes on. The execution goes on. At some point of time, the garbage collector says, ha, huh, too many objects in memory. How about I kill some of them? And then the garbage collector starts. If you look at how Java works, if you, if you run the profile or some application, then the memory will go like this. The memory consumption, the, the Java consumes more and more and more memory. At some point, the execution pauses for a few milliseconds. Everything is like, boom, stops. So no, nobody can allocate any more memory. Garbage collection says, hold on for a second. They all get on pause, and then boom, the Java frees like megabytes of memory. And again, it's like small in memory, and it starts growing again. So Java, so garbage collection works like this. It has some benefits, because it doesn't touch the memory every time the scope of visibility finishes, because C++ will go to memory very frequently. Every time the function is finished, it goes to memory and frees the objects. Java will let the execution flow, so Java will be faster in this way. But at some point of time, garbage collection has to do a lot of work. There are some optimization mechanisms, how to do it faster, how to improve it, but they're basically, these are, these are the approaches. So this um, design pattern actually exploits, uh, uses this approach. So we have here, we don't close the file explicitly. Take a look. There is no instruction in the foo method. We never say close. We just expect that the closing will happen in the destructor. So we acquisition of the resources is happening in the initialization of an object. So initialization of an object means acquisition of the resource. When the object is not, need, is not needed, the resource is automatically freed. It's very convenient for end users, for programmers, because if we remove, like, don't, don't look at the code which stays on top of the function foo. You will see what? Very simple. You don't think about opening file. You don't think about closing file. You just say, I need this file. I write into this file. End of story. Everything else happens behind the scene. Everything else, hap everything help happens automatically, more or less, which is great. It's called RAII. -I, I don't know how to pronounce it. RAI probably. RAI design pattern. I'm sorry to you putting my name or something. Why its name like this? 
Yeah, because uh, it's, that's a good question. Why it's called resource acquisition is in, in Israelization. Um, because they, ex because uh, the constructor, the initial, initialization is the construction, basically. Initialization means construction of an object. So initialization happens in the constructor. So the constructor of the file, which we have the line open, f open, this initialization. And at the same time with initialization, we have resource acquisition. Resource is a file. So we acquire resources when we initialize the, the, the object. When we destroy an object, automatically resources get freed. So, but, but they don't put it in the name. Because the full name of the design pattern would be resource acquisition is initialization, resource uh, releasing is deinitialization. That would be the full name of the design pattern. But they cut the second part. They said resource acquisition is initialization. Comma, resource releasing is destruction, is deinitialization or destruction. That would be the full name of this pattern. Something like that. I don't I didn't make this up. It's not my name. I would probably name it differently, but this is this is how it's named. Really? Yeah. Who said it? Bjorn. Bjorn Okay. So you see that the Bjorn, the, who saw my interview with Bjorn recently? I interviewed this guy probably three or four weeks ago on my YouTube channel, the creator of C++, so you can, you can find it. So yeah, if he says this, that that would be a better name, then it would be a better name. Okay, now, and so I gave you just two examples, two patterns out of 36. I'm not gonna tell you about all of them. You can read them by yourself. Next one is and some anti-patterns. This is more interesting. Anti-patterns. The number one anti-pattern is go to. We discussed it before. Let's discuss it a little bit more. Take a look at the example above. Function foo expects the argument, and it says if the argument is, uh, who knows what this percent, this percentage sign means? Say it. Remainder of the division, that's right. So if a percentage two equals to zero, it means that the number is even, right? Like two, four, six, eight, et cetera, et cetera. So we check if it's even, we print even, and then we go to exit. So we exit the function. Otherwise we print odd, and we also exit the function. It's very simple, right? Very simple algorithm with the go to operator. Can we get rid of the go to? Yes, we can. That's the second option. The second part of this text explains how we can get rid of the go to. This is called anti pattern by so many people. But as you know, we discussed this. Linux kernel has tons of this anti pattern. In my opinion, it's an anti pattern. Not only my opinion, Google it. But Linux, Linux actually thinks differently. Okay. That's it. Next one, magic numbers. This is funny. Magic numbers. Take a look at this code. Who actually understands Ruby? Who of you understands Ruby? None of you, right? That's great. Ruby, Ruby programming language. No. This is actually my favorite programming language. Even though I was writing Java for like, I don't know how many years. I started writing Java when this was Java version 1.0. Like really 1.0. And I, was, I think I told you, we were expecting a Java 1.1 as like the real new product, 1.1. Because there were so many like additions there, there were new libraries there. I remember that we even, um, there was even the map of all objects in Java. Like it was like one big uh, piece of paper on the wall. We, we got it from, uh, from Sun at that time and I put it on the wall and then Java 1, 1.1 made a really big contribution to Java. Anyway, now it's Java, 15 or something. So now it's a completely different story. So I was writing C++, I was writing Java, Pascal, Assembly, PHP, but Ruby, in my opinion, is really the best programming language, the fastest, the easiest to write, and so on and so forth. So look at this code. What do we see here? It's a function. Def points means new function points. Points is the name of the function. Def and end, this is the function. Then what do we do? We say file.readlines. You can imagine what is readlines. It's a static method, unfortunately. So we do, we do file.readline, so we read this file, data user CSV. Then we do the mapping, because read lines will return an array of lines. Then we do mapping. Who knows what is mapping on an array? You understand what it is, right? And what it is? Apply the function. Apply function to each element. Is it declarative or imperative? That's the question. Huh? 
Declarative, exactly. This is declarative because map most probably doesn't do anything with the array. <laughs> depends on the, exactly. Depends on the language. Depends on the implementation. You can write this method map in an imperative way, so it will immediately, you will say map, it will take your array, go through item by item, and apply function to all items. That will be imperative way. Or you can make it declarative. You say map, it says, no problem, this is the new array for you. And then you say, give me the item number 17. And only then it takes the number on the item 17, applies the function, and returns you the new, the new item. So in this case, we don't know. We don't know what's the implementation, so what do we do here? We do map, and then T in this, uh, in this pipeline means the argument, and then you do split. So you take each line and split it into, split it by the comma. But you only take 11, 11 elements, and then the rest will be on the last element. If there are more commas, then only 11 you will take. That's why the number 11. Then the next map will take the element uh, seven, Oh yeah, so it will split, okay, it, it was the array of lines, and then we have array of arrays, because each line is split into, it becomes an array. So on this, on then the second map, will take the seventh element, convert it to integer, 2i means to integer, and then we have an array of numbers. And then the last line inject, will do, who understands what's gonna happen here? Maybe something like accumulation. Accumulation, exactly, yes. It will take an array of numbers, and then using the operator plus, this ampersand and uh, semicolon, then like it starts, it, 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 um, it prepends the operator. So the real operator is plus. So it will take all the numbers and summarize them, like plus, 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 plus. So this is how easy you can write very complex algorithm with Ruby. You can see how powerful is the language. But we're talking about magic numbers. So the questions are, why the, the, the file is right there, data user CSV. If I open this code after like two years of somebody wrote this code, I just ask like, why the file is there? Data user CSV, what does it mean? What is data? How do you know that it's placed there? Like, what does it mean? And then what is 11? Why 11? Why not 10? What happens here? Like, is it some format? Who can explain me what's going on? And then I take the column seven. Why seven? What is the, the age of the, or the points? Like, what's going on with this column seven? What happened in the column six? What, what's, what's after? And so on and so forth. So many questions. So people argue that these are the magic numbers, so-called, and we should not use them. So instead of saying 11, we should say, for example, total number of columns. Instead of saying seven, we should say the column with uh, you know, achievement points. Instead of saying the, the file name, we should say file name of something, blah, blah, blah. So these are magic numbers, and people think they're anti-patterns. All people, most people. I think a little bit different sometimes. I'll explain you how and why. But in this case, I believe that they are actually, uh, that code is definitely wrong. So these magic numbers have to be replaced, but not all of them. Sometimes we may need numbers. For example, take a look at this method. Again, I'm using Ruby. So the first one is we convert hours to seconds, age to sec. So I give you hours and you give me seconds. How do you do this? You multiply age by 60 and then by 60, right? Some people may say, come on, two magic numbers, 60 and 60. How about we rewrite it like this? seconds and minutes, minutes and hours, and then multiplication. Did we really make the code better? Not really, right? Because the first code is definitely better. Because 60 is obvious what is 60. So no programmer in the world, after 10 years of me writing this code, would never say, what is 60? What does it mean? Why 60? Why not 61? That question will never show up. So that's why, you know, getting rid of all magic numbers is a bad idea. But some people do it like this. You can meet a lot of code like that. Minutes and seconds, or seconds and minutes, it's a very popular constant for, for, for Java world, for sure. So I believe this is just an over, uh, overthinking, I don't know, overcoding. So don't do this. This is magic numbers, not. These are not magic numbers, they're just numbers, 60. 60 is an obvious number, everybody understands what it is. What, um, what is the big problem? Uh, 
Okay, good question. So how about we, instead of renaming, instead of introducing these variables, we just put a comment there yeah, and saying 60 means this and 60 means that. Well, I personally am against comments inside the method of the, inside the, the body of the method. So I believe that the code inside the method in general must not contain any comments. So you start a method, you write the code, you finish the method, no comments inside whatsoever. And no empty lines. This is my personal rule. So your body, the body of your method should be no comments, no empty lines. It should be like a solid piece of text. So commenting here, I would recommend to not do. That's my personal opinion. In general, commenting on constants is bad. Why? Because comments and code, they stay together for some time. And then at some time, they may separate without your attention. For example, you forget, you don't understand, there's a lot of text here, there's somebody comes in, ask you to fix the bug, you take that piece of code, you move it somewhere, you forget to move the comment. And then the comment stays there. And then in three months, I show up and I open the code, there's some comment which is irrelevant to the code below, I don't know what to do. So the comments and code, they are not connected together and no compiler will prevent me from moving the code and leaving the comment there. You know, so if there is a solid piece of text in the in the method, then the text is staying together, and I cannot just take part of it and move somewhere else. The compiler will complain. I mean, the, the execution will break. The compiler will complain. Depends on the language, but the comments they are free to go anywhere. So that's why comments are bad in general because they are not compile. Uh, they're not. Uh, they're not checkable. They're not. Uh, you know. Nobody can catch what's going on there. That's why many people recommend not to write comments because eventually they um, they um, they expire. They get uh, you know they get irrelevant. They become irrelevant to the code and they start messing up with the with the programmers. Programmers don't understand what they mean. So no comments. Forget about comments. If you want to read comments, then write the comments for the method for the class. So that's okay. For example, in front of the method, you put the comment on top of the method and say, this method does this, this, and that. Nobody, no sane programmer, will just take this part and move somewhere. Because everybody understands that this stuff, they stay together. The method and the comment, they're always the same. We move them, we move them together. But if there's a text in there and the comment in here, I don't know exactly what it belongs to. I can take it away and move, you know, it's less connected. The same for the class. There's a class, and on top you have the comment. That's okay. If the function is big, the good question, if the function is big, if you need to comment the code inside the function, then you're doing something wrong. Your function has to be small enough to be self-explainable. That's like the mantra of programming. You can, like many people will tell you exactly the same. It's not me saying. Long function is a, in general, it's a horrible idea. Long function is a source of so many troubles in, in, in software development. And comments, don't solve the problem, they only make the problem worse. Because instead of solving the problem and making your code shorter, you just, you know, you basically, you paint the broken, the car is broken, but instead of fixing the car, you paint it with a nice color. Actually, you need to fix the car, not paint it. The same here. It's like the shoes, the shoes are dirty, but you, instead of cleaning the shoes, you put the, the, black, the black paint on top of it. Why no empty lines? That's a good question. I, I, I use this rule for, for so many years. There's no empty lines of code. And my code actually is much better because of this. Uh, I think that the line, an empty line inside the method tells us that the method contains two things, two blocks, two parts of the algorithm, which are by the, by the, by the thinking of programmer, they don't really belong to each other so much. So the programmer decides to separate them with the line. So if you think that they should be separate, then move them to two different functions. So when you start, when you think that it's time to enter the empty line, you're telling yourself, first of all, that, that these two blocks, they, they are kind of doing two different things. So it's time to move them apart. So the block of code, the block of text has to be solid block of text. And we look at it and you understand that it does only one thing, and we cannot break it into parts. It's unbreakable piece of code. And the empty line is like a sign to us, like, no, 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 it's breakable. And actually, the programmer wants it to break. The programmer itself, who wrote this code, just tells us that, yeah, I would break it here, in the middle. So why not break it? So we actually, when we write our code in Java, we have the static analyzer, which actually uh, prohibits 
anybody from making empty lines. So if you make an empty line, the static analyzer will just reject you, and that's it. So I suggest you do the same. No empty lines. Say again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're saying that when they teach programming, they ask students to write inline comments. Exactly. Is it really true? Yeah. Any assignment. Any assignment, really. Well, maybe it's like a part of the educational uh, you know, experiment, so they ask you to explain your code so that the teacher can take a look, maybe for yourself, so you can understand what's going on. But in production code, if you would be a programmer right, like working in my team, I would reject your code immediately. No comments, definitely. So maybe it's like part of education for you to understand what's going on, to explain your progress. But when you go to real coding, to real, to real production, then absolutely no comments in any places. So just, you know, use it while they teach you. It's okay, do it, explain, so the code will be easier for you. Actually, you know, they recommend, that's what I do. They recommend when I write some complex method, I do it still. I was doing it when I was a student, I still do it. First of all, I write comments and I explain to myself what's gonna happen. Here I read the file, then I convert the data, then I convert the data again, then I store the file, then I go to the database, then I print it. I write like five lines of comment. And then I implement the first line, I remove the comment line and I put the code. Remove the second line, I put the code. I remove the third line and I put the code. That's how I design the code. And then eventually I have the full structure. But comments are gone. Comments should be, they, they should disappear. They should not stay in your, in your, in your code. Yeah? But when you read your code better, maybe you will not be able to uh, remember like, what was... What happened there, yeah? Yeah, so and for this, if you read your code later, in order to remember what happened, just make a rule. The code, the, the line, the, the, the length of the method should be no more than 10 lines. And that's it. 10 lines you will always understand. Because you have the title of the method, you have maybe the block of comments on top of the method, which explains what the method is for, which explain that. That will be enough. But if your method is 50 lines length, or maybe 100 lines, then of course it will be difficult to understand what's going on, especially there are no comments and no empty lines. That's obviously going to be a big problem for you. But don't make such long methods. Make the method shorter than 10 lines. And better, configure the static analyzer, which will prohibit you from having any methods which are longer than a certain amount of statements or lines or whatever, or branches. It's not good, no. You're saying that, yeah, you have, instead of like many long method, you just introduce five functions and then you move data from function, you fun push, yes, of course that's wrong. So the better approach is object-oriented programming. So instead of five functions, introduce five objects, encapsulate one into another into another, and then everything will be bright. bright. Of course, if it's a long method of 100 lines, it's not a good idea just to break it. It's, it's okay, it's better idea than to keep the long method to break it down into five methods, 20, 20, 20 lines. But a better idea, the next step, is to think about how we can introduce objects. So we can have five, six objects which will be composed together in some structure, make a larger object which will work. So that's the next step. Yeah. Say again? Long strings? Dog strings? Oh yeah, dog strings. What is what is this? Oh, it's like a comma comma and then the text 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 and then con and then in the end also quote quote. In Python? Yeah, and in Java as well, yes. So you have your code in these special comments, you import some tool like. Java oh, like Java doc, you mean? Yeah, Java doc is fine. Yeah, you call it doc strings. Yeah, Java doc or something like this is perfectly fine. Of course. Like I said, yeah, it's perfectly fine to document the method or document the class. But never ever put any comments inside the method. That's just 
Just no go for sure. Okay, next one is God class. We discussed that already. So it's an anti-pattern. What is the God class? Who can explain? Oh, it says large class, but who can explain the God class? What is the class that does everything? Class that does everything. Yeah, exactly. So it's a class which does basically everything, many, many things. And many people design their software like this. Me, I was one of them as well. I remember when I was much younger, I had like classes with, uh, I don't know, a hundred methods, a hundred. And if you need an extra method, they just put 101, 102, why not? There's so many of them. You need to, and then in, at some point of time, you ask yourself, why do you need other classes? This class is perfect. Everything is inside. All the attributes are here, all the methods are here. But eventually you understand that it's not a class, actually. It's just a collection of procedures. Just a collection of functions, just a plain, you don't need object-oriented programming, you don't need a class for this. It's just a normal program with functions, functions, functions. You, you're just getting back to procedural programming. So God class is the very typical mistake of, uh, of young programmers. In order to stay away from that, the rule is simple. Make your class immutable, that's first. So all your attributes have to be final if you're in Java. Final, if you're in other languages, find some other instruments, but they have to be final. That will prevent you from making God class. You will not be able to make God class, that's it. It's just uh, not gonna be possible. That's one rule. And second rule, of course, try to stay away from a large amount of attributes. So my rule of thumb is that uh, if you have more than four attributes in your class, that's it, you're doing it wrong. So four attributes is the end of the, is the maximum, the absolute maximum, four attributes. One, two, three is okay, four is okay, that's it, five is wrong. If you need five attributes in your class, make it different, refactor it, make another class, five. Spaghetti code. Have you heard about this? Spaghetti code. Why spaghetti? Because look at this code. I found this picture on Google. Um, it's, it's called spaghetti code. So basically it's the code with many go-to statements, which go one to another, one to another. In order to understand how it works, you need to basically follow the execution flow, jump mentally, you know, in your brain, jump from place to place. And that's how you understand the logic of the code. And that they called it spaghetti because it looks like spaghetti. That's an anti-pattern. Another one I found actually when I was reading on about spaghetti code, preparing for this lecture, I found lasagna and ravioli code. <laughs> Surprisingly, yes. So they introduced in 1990s spaghetti code. In 2000 it was uh, lasagna code, lasagna architecture. And lasagna architecture means that, um, if I'm not mistaken, means that uh, the layers of your architecture are so much interconnected that you cannot basically say that there are layers anymore. For example, you have the layer which is responsible for representing your data in HTML format. And then you have a layer which is responsible for taking the data from the database. So there are two layers in your, in your architecture. And then lasagna code, they start calling each other. And sometimes this layer calls that layer and this way and that way in a different way. So eventually you basically have no two layers, but just lasagna. That's what they say. And ravioli means that uh, we have many classes, like raviolis, many classes. They're very smart internally. They know how to work, but they don't interconnect. So they don't know how to connect, something like this. So they, uh, they, they start implementing a lot of logic inside each other, but interconnections between them are kind of broken. So something like that, Google it. At least you need to know that there is spaghetti, lasagna, and ravioli. So, anti-object-oriented patterns. I'm tell you about, I want to tell you about patterns which exist, which people think they're good, but I believe they're wrong. Number, well, actually, I made a blog post, again, a blog post seven years ago about them, and I listed them there, which I believe there are 11, 11 design patterns, which I think are very, very wrong in object-oriented programming, uh, which people believe are okay, at least okay. For example, utility classes, we discussed that today. Mutable objects, we talked about that. Getters, setters, data transfer objects, object relational mapping. Who knows what is ORM, object relational mapping? You know about this. I believe it's a very bad anti-pattern. And I have also a blog post about it. Controllers, managers, validators. Actually, all objects, all classes which end with ER are considered to be anti-patterns. Printer, scanner, controller, manager, dispatcher, router, 
all of them are by definition bad bad practices. It's not me. I didn't invent this rule. I read about it. Yeah. But what if we are making, for example, some system which manages, I don't know. Printers or computers. Yeah, in this case it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Like user. User also ends with ER, but user is, is a user it's okay, yeah. <laughs> But I'm talking about something which do not exist in real world, like managers, uh, dispatchers, controllers, like I said, all of this stuff. They are bad ideas. Printers, yeah. They are approved by the community. That's a good question. So why we, uh, why they are approved by the community? Actually, the community is not really. Uh, uh, homogeneous. The community is not uh, not all people in the community think the same. So if you go to Google and say uh, object relational ORM is pattern, then it's going to be one set of results. If you say is anti-pattern, you will find many blog posts saying that ORM is an anti-pattern. The same will happen for singleton. The same will happen. So the community in the community we have different opinions. Some people think the one way. Some people think another way. People write books about that. Some of them advocate for single tones. Some of them advocate strongly against single tones. So don't, um, don't expect one book to be right about software engineering or design patterns. Uh, read both sides, both, uh, both, both uh, many opinions. And in this case, we have different opinions about, for example, static methods or, uh, like I said, data transfer object. So there are many anti-patterns, I'll tell you about a few of them. First one, my favorite one, data transfer object. Who knows what it is, data transfer object? This is a very popular, a few people, very popular stuff in Java programming. They basically invented, I think, this, this data transfer object. It's when the, uh, you get the one class and the, you need to take some data from this class and move this data to another class, but the data is so huge, so there are so many elements of the data then you cannot just take a string or, or a number, so you take data transfer object, which is not really an object, but like a dictionary. It's like a storage of data, storage of, of, of elements, storage of other data. And then I think, this I think is a very bad idea, but uh, it's, uh, it, was, it appeared because Java has this uh, getters and setters concept, which was also introduced I believe by a huge mistake. So take a look at the first example, getters and setters, which is wrong. For example, the dog, so we say new object dog, then we set weight, 23 kilograms, and then we get the weight out of the dog. This is getter and setter. The first one is setter. So the dog is constructed by the constructor with no weight. So the dog has no weight at the beginning. And then we inject the data into the object. So we don't, Treat this object as a computer. Remember we discussed what, what are objects. The objects are computers, like the quanta of the universe. How the hell can we make a quanta and then inject something into this quanta and say, I don't care what's inside, I don't care you're the computer, I just get the piece of data and inject into you because I later want to take it back. So that's how I treat you, that's how I respect you. Absolutely no respect. So we just treat this object as a, uh, they call it, uh, you know, anemic anemic objects. I didn't say it here, I just um, remember it now. Anemic, which means they don't move, they don't do anything. They're very uh, speechless creatures. They're just storage, just bags of data, just containers of data. And that leads to bad design. And the second uh, piece of code is much better. So we make the code, we make the dog uh, together with the weight encapsulated. And then we can only read the weight and ask, what is your weight? Maybe in this case, we don't even say get weight. We just say, wait, what's your weight? Just, just measure yourself. And we don't know how it will be measured. Well, maybe the dog will go to the database for the weight. Maybe the dog will get this, day, this weight from the file, maybe from the network, we don't know. We don't know what's inside the object. We don't expect the object to be the container of data. We expect it to be something smart, the computer which thinks and works. So the bottom line, don't use getters and setters. Don't do, use data transfer objects. Second line, utility classes. We discussed it already again uh, today. So this is the example with the maximum. You see, that's, uh, that's, we had a discussion about this. So let's imagine we have um, the day number utils. Number utils is the, uh, the utility class with one single static method called max, which calculates the maximum between two numbers. The alternative approach would be the class, which is called max. That's exactly what I suggested you earlier. So the class max will encapsulate 
number A, the, the, the A, the B, which is X and Y, and then it behaves like a number, declarative approach. We spent some time on the previous lecture discussing this. So I suggest that utility class, even though some books will recommend you to use it, I strongly recommend not to do this. Next one, singleton. That's the favorite one, singleton. Probably you know what it is, right? Or no, who knows singleton? And who use singletons? Okay, there you go. So you do use singletons. Take a look at this database. So the database is supposed to be like a, like a class which uh, has the um, static instance, static uh, attribute instance, which is, oh, this is a mistake. It should be private. So usually this attribute is private. No, sorry, no, no, it's okay. It's public, but the constructor is private. So nobody can make a new instance of the class database. That's the feature of singleton. So singleton is only made once, and only made once when it's declared. So when it's declared, immediately when it gets into runtime, immediately the constructor is called. The constructor usually is empty, so it doesn't do anything, even though it says start here. But usually the constructor is empty because it, it's supposed not to do anything. I mean, maybe it connects to the database. It's also possible. Yeah, I think it may connect to the database, even though I would not do it. And, um, and, then, uh, and then we go to this class, like in the example, we say database.instance.connect. So what's the purpose of singleton? Do you know why people invented singleton? Yes. Exactly, to prevent recreation of something which is expensive. So people don't want this class database to be created again and again and again. So they make it in one place, it's created only once, and then if you need it, you go to the static public instance. The people also thought that it would be difficult or inconvenient to create it once somewhere and then pass it as an argument to everywhere, which is, I believe is the right way to go. So they think, okay, come on, we don't want to go around the code and give everybody this object and say, okay, this is the database, this is the database. Instead, we just say, hey, you need a database, go there. And then code here, look at this class foo. The, no, that's, that's the counter example. So I'm saying that the right way is this, like in the class foo. So instead of asking the class foo to go somewhere, we just inject this database into the class foo. That should be the better way. Here we don't reuse the connection, but we don't reconnect to the database. So let's say we connect it in the constructor when I say start. So when the connection happens only once, and then when you say connect, we're gonna only fetch the connection from some pool and return to you. So still the reconnection to the database is not happening because we started the connection only in the constructor. And let me ask the question, quite tricky one. Why do you think the singleton is better than just make a static method, uh, just make a static method uh, uh, database. Uh, yeah, so what's the point of the, what is the point of the instance? So why can't we make this method connect static and remove the instance? There will be also singleton. The only, there also will be one instance of the class the constructor will be private, so we're gonna connect to the debate to the database only once. So the method will be uh, static, this connect method will be static. So why this mess with the, with the instance? What's the point? How do you think? Like imagine we get rid of the instance, the line, the second line in this example. Imagine we get rid of the instance and we only have the constructor, the private constructor which connects and then we have the method connect, which fetches the connection. But if there will, will be any object uh, or any... No object, there will be no object, yes. What's wrong with this? What do you think? I keep asking this question on the interview. When I hire programmers, I ask them this question. Most people don't answer. But some people do. Because there is a difference. Well, probably you may not know because you're not experienced programmers yet, but the trick is we need this instance for testing, for unit testing. 
Because if you get rid of the instance and only have the static constructor and static method, then it will be impossible to do unit tests. So with the, with the instance, we will be able to inject this instance, to, inst to inject a fake instance into this singleton. And all the code around will still come to the singleton, but the singleton will still come to the same instance, but they will reach different object there. So because we have an object, it's replaceable. So static methods, they're not replaceable. You will probably learn this when we're gonna talk about unit testing. So static methods, they cannot be replaced unless you use some super, super powerful framework. But objects are easily replaceable during unit testing. So that's why the singleton have this instance in order to make it, uh, that's how I understand singletons, in order to make it more suitable for unit testing. Anyway, in my opinion, this is the link to the blog post of mine where I'm like explaining this in more details. So I believe that singleton is an anti-pattern, not a pattern. Object relational mapping. Object relational mapping is, uh, is a terrible idea. Uh, what happens, how it works, how object relational mapping works. Uh, it is the, we have the session, so-called, responsible for talking to the database. Then we come to this session and say, give me the car from the database, relational database, and it returns me the object. Usually it's data transfer object. Then I inject some information into this car, and I come back to this session and say, store it back to the database. Give me the object, which is not an object, which is a very simple container of information. Give me this container, I fill it up with data, and I return it back to you. This is, has nothing to do with object-oriented programming. The better way would be to create an object, I called it uh, SQL, SQL speaking object, or SQL speaking object, which will work differently. You make an object, you encapsulate in this object, encapsulate the connection to the database, and then you talk to the object, and say what needs to be done. And the object deals with the database. So I'm not a controller anymore. I'm not just the database is here, the, the object is here. You, I talk to the database, it returns me the object, I fill it with data and return to the database. Instead, here's my object and I talk to the object. The object talks to the database. That's the idea which we discussed on the previous lecture. How about performance? Yeah, good question. So how about the, the connection, which we don't, we don't want to make a, a number of round trips to the database to change the title of the book and then to change the date of the book and to change the author. So we want to change everything in one go. So that's why it seems to be more convenient. You take the objects from the, this data transfer objects from the database, then you inject all the data you want, return it back, and one transaction goes to the database. How we do it in this case? I believe it's doable. You just implement in the object the transaction management. So in the object, you can say set, set, set. The implementation of this stuff in the object has to be done just differently. So the object has to be smarter in order to adopt this. The object still has to go to do one round trip to the database, but how exactly depends on the implementation. We discussed this uh, in the blog post. I suggested a number of examples how it could be done, but it can be done. It can be done in the, in, in the object. You can introduce, for example, I don't know, there can be some logic. So we can discuss it probably separately. Not so much time. So let's continue. I will show you some refactorings. The refactoring, who knows what the refactoring is? We discussed already. Refactoring is the change you make to the code without changing the functionality. Uh, that's a very good book about refactoring, about the very good author, Martin Fowler, who I mentioned to you already. Um, the book says that very interesting quote, actually. If you read the quote, it says that when I do refactoring, the first step is always the same. We need to have a solid test of the section of code. So no refactoring can happen without tests. That's a precursor. It's a, like a mandatory precondition to refactoring. When you take a piece of code and you say the code needs to work faster, or the code is not maintainable now, I cannot understand how it works. I need to refactor it. I need to make it cleaner. I need to get rid of magic numbers. I need to get rid of long methods. I need to improve it. My first step has to be, where is the test? 
Because I cannot, I cannot start refactoring without making sure that I'm not breaking anything. How can I be sure that I'm not breaking anything? There's a test. So usually refactoring starts like this. That's how I do it. I see the piece of code which I don't like. I find the test. I run the test. The test says green, no problem, no errors. Then I start changing the code, running the test. Changing, running, changing, running at the same time. I change a little bit, I run. I change a little bit, I run. That's how refactoring works. That's how it should work. So it's not like I open a huge amount of code, I do a lot of refactoring, and then I send it to production and hope everything will be good. That's what Martin is saying. So we need before starting the test. The tests are essential because even though I follow refactoring structure uh, to avoid most of the opportunities for introducing bugs, I'm still human and I still make mistakes. Thus, I need solid tests. Um, sometimes people compare unit tests, which we will discuss in the next lectures. Some people compare unit tests with a safety net. So when you say you're fixing the lamp there, or like people working on the, uh, you know, with the electricity on the, on the top of these uh, piles, so they're working on something and then they can drop something down. And in order to this not to happen, they put the safety net beneath, uh, under them. And when they work, something falls, the net catches this. Or maybe they fall. They fall, they drop down, and then they fall right into the safety net. The same for unit tests. So the unit tests are like safety net for you. If the unit tests exist, then you can refactor without problem. If there are no unit tests or unit tests are weak, so for example, there's a unit test. I run it, then I change the code, and it still runs. And then I break the code intentionally, and the test still runs then I know that I don't have a safety net. So I cannot continue refactoring because I don't have the protection. So refactoring goes together with unit testing. I will give you an example of the one refactoring, just one, which is called extract method. So take a look at the example on top. So this function on top, which is called root, is calculating the root, two roots actually, of a quadratic equation. You, you probably know what this equation is, right? On the top right corner. That's to calculate the roots I'm sure you know what it is. So the function on the left, which is called root, it does it. But took a look at the line uh, R1 and R2. They're very similar. They're doing very similar thing. The only difference is one, one sign. In one line, it's plus D. In another line, it's minus D. So it's obvious that there is an opportunity to extract this method and make it the method R, for example, which I made on the second example. So in the first part, we have a long method of, five, of four lines. Now we have two methods. One method has two lines, another method has one line. This is a refactoring. I didn't change the functionality of the method root, of the function root. It's still the same function. But now I have two functions. Well, for me, for the user, it's still one function, root. So the user is not supposed to call function r. But, uh, but now it's smaller. Of course, it's quite a primitive example. In real life, you're not going to refactor the method of four lines. But still, it could be. Because in this case, it was quite obvious uh, code duplication on the top, on the first, uh, on the first example, on the first uh, sample, first snippet. On the second one, code duplication is gone. So we don't have, because here, look, R1 equals R2 equals very similar lines of code. It's not good to have them. It's not good to duplicate yourself. This is refactoring. That's an example of refactoring. Of course, before refactoring this method root, I need a test. Because look, there are mathematical arithmetic operations which I cannot trust myself that I'm not going to break anything. So I write the test for it. I run the test with a number of parameters. I make sure it returns me the right numbers. And then I start refactoring. So extract method is quite popular refactoring. So we're finishing. Uh, I'm going to tell you again the books, the venues, the call to action. The books, uh, this two one, working effectively with, effectively with legacy code. Michael Feathers, a uh, very good author, very good book, very popular. This book will tell you a lot about refactoring, about working with the code. You know what is legacy code? The legacy code is the code which you inherit from your friends who probably already fired for writing bad code. And then you step in and you need to deal with this legacy code. So legacy is like what you get from your grandparents. This is your legacy. The same here. And there's a huge book explaining how to deal with this legacy code. The second one is refactoring. Like I said, Martin Fowler, great book, read it. 
Oh, two more books. Uh, this one I already told you about, Design Patterns by the Gang of Four, which I recommend you to read, like, you know, don't pay too much attention, but you need to at least know what's going on. Because the book is quite old, but most of the patterns actually are still alive. The second one I highly recommend you, even though if you're not C++ programmer. Because I'm not C++, like really C++ programmer, I wrote C++ a long time ago, but I really enjoyed this book, Effective C++. The book is written very well, it's easy to read, it's easy, it's very, you know, in a very open way, not formal, way less formal than the book on the left. The book on the left is super boring, super, extremely boring. So if you read it through, it's like a, you'll be a hero. The book is on the right, it's fun to read. So you read it, you enjoy it. It tells you a very interesting story about C++, how it is designed. 55 interesting secrets, 55 recommendations they give you to improve your C++ code. So I very much recommend. If the book on the left, I say, okay, you have to read it because on the interview they will ask you about this stuff, so you need to know this. The book on the right, enjoy it. You will improve yourself as a, you will be a better programmer. Okay, the where to publish. The first one, Splash, I told you about this conference multiple times. That's the place where you publish your stuff if you are a researcher. The second one is our conference, which we organize. I am one of the organizers of this conference. So we do it for the second year now. And this year it is, spawn it is uh, organized together with Annapolis University. So we will have it uh, next year in April. Now it is expecting papers, expecting publications. If you uh, writing something, if you want to write something, you're free to do this and submit to, to this conference. It's pretty well organized, I believe. It's, sub it's supported by SIGPLAN, SIGSOFT, and IEEE. So it's, um, in our opinion, it's the, it's the growing place to, so I'm, I'm promoting now our, our conference. And uh, the chief of the program committee is uh, Giancarlo Succi, you probably know him. <laughs> so? It's a, it's a very friendly conference, so submit, submit to us. And I am the member of organizing committee. Next one, call to action. So I suggest you in your application, which you do, which you prepare for your, for your grading, uh, demonstrate the usage of four design patterns. Just find in your code where you use design patterns and, and mention this in the comments and say, here I'm using this design pattern, here I'm using this one. Here. That will make your design part for the grading you know, we give the points for design. So if you mention the design patterns, that will be very good for reviewers because we will understand, okay, this, this author actually understands these four different design patterns, understands how to use them. Just mention that in this file, I use design pattern singleton. In this one, I use static method. And in this one, null references. <laughs> Don't do this, I'm joking. And also I suggest to create four, to, to try to implement four refactorings. So you have the code, Look at your code and think, how can I improve it? And make the refactoring, but not just make it immediately, but make a pull request for your own code, for your own repository. Make a pull request for yourself and call it refactoring class ABC. And then introduce the refactoring and make sure there's the test which covers it, everything is clean. Okay, and now the issues, the four things which I believe are good to think about in the area of design patterns. First of all is how to prove that certain patterns are anti-patterns. That's a big question. How do we know that singleton is an anti-pattern? I believe so, but how can we prove it scientifically? I don't know, I don't have an answer. Second one, how to find methods for automated refactoring. Refactoring is a good idea when you look at the code, improve it, and the code becomes better. How the computer can do this? How artificial intelligence can do this? How can we refactor massive amounts of code, like millions of lines of code, legacy code? Can we implement automated refactoring? That's the, I, that's the question for future research, which actually we are doing in, in my laboratory, we are doing this research right now. Like how can we improve, like how, how can we refactor the code, Java code automatically without people? So you give me the code, the machine runs and improves the code. Number three, how to guarantee validity during refactoring. So it's a good question to, re, it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's not so difficult to refactor. The question is how can we prove that we didn't break the code? Because tests are not perfect. Tests do not cover everything all the time. Tests very often are absent in real code. So how can we take a few hundred thousand lines of code, refactor it a little bit, and prove and guarantee that it's not broken? And the final one, how can we mine patterns from the code? So how can we look at the code and say, in these 15 files, we use exactly the same pattern. 
similar, similar, similar. And then this pattern, let's call it ABC, and we can apply this pattern to maybe another code. So this mining of part, they call it mining, patterns mining. So you look at the code and you understand, this is the pattern, I can smell this pattern, this pattern. It, it, is, it is singleton, and this is singleton, and this is singleton, but singleton is primitive, it's very easy to detect. But how can we detect more complex design patterns? That's again the question for future research, for scientists, maybe for you. So that's it, thanks for now, see you next time.